In fact, the silicon putty will flow under its own weight if enough time is allowed. You may not expect rock to behave in this fashion, but in fact it does if it's given sufficient time. This gravestone bent in this fashion given 145 years. So time is important in plastically. Heat and pressure are other stresses applied to rock, such as gneiss and schist that we saw folded in the slide. In this case, we can investigate it by keeping a control sample of a piece of uh, rock with a very distinct lamination in it, such as might be found in a fine-grained schist. I'm taking another sample and encasing it in a steel jacket setting that inside a copper tube, attaching pistons, steel pistons, to either end. And sealing the whole assembly in a pressure chamber. The pressure chamber can then be inserted inside a hydraulic press and a heating jacket placed around it in order to heat the sample at the same time as the temperature as the pressure is being raised. The apparatus is then adjusted to simulate the conditions at 20 kilometers depth. First of all, the confining pressure. is raised and then the temperature to about 500 degrees centigrade. The sample is then being subjected to a uniform stress from all directions. If another stress, a directed stress, is applied, this simulates the kind of conditions that the rock might be under at 20 kilometers of depth. just as the gneiss and the schist must be during high-grade metamorphism. The sample is then extracted and ground down in order to see the effects of the heat and the pressure. The contrast to the original sample is very marked. The original straight laminations have been folded in an intricate and sharp fashion. That's the kind of folding that we saw on the outcrop. On the outcrop, it was at somewhat larger a scale. So the application of heat and pressure, acting over a period of time, have folded the rock. In this case, the scale is greater, but the form, very comparable. So heat and pressure acting over a period of time are the influences which not only cause new minerals to grow in rocks, but also cause them to behave in a plastic fashion. And just like the growth of new minerals, the ability of rock to behave in a plastic fashion depends upon changes in the internal atomic structure. Not in this case the reassembly of certain elements to form new minerals, but in fact it depends upon slight dislocations within the structure of the minerals which make up the rock. We can use a raft of bubbles to illustrate the internal atomic structure of the mineral grains in the rock. The individual bubbles in the raft represent atoms. And as they slip by one another a step at a time, they allow dislocations to travel through the raft, representing the crystal lattice of a mineral, right through to the boundaries of the, of the mineral. And a copper rod 
built out of a single crystal bends very easily as the dislocations pass through it. But if we take a polycrystalline material, as what in fact most copper is, like rock, then the behavior is, is slightly different. The dislocations in the bubble raft come to an edge, or come to an end, at the edge of the simulated individual grains. And one can imagine that the material would not bend as easily. And a polycrystalline copper rod, in fact, is very much more difficult to bend than one made out of a single crystal. If atoms of tin are inserted into the copper, making it an alloy, then the copper becomes even stronger because the larger atoms of tin distort the crystal lattice and prevent the dislocations moving very far through the, the crystal. You can imagine this kind of behavior taking place in the minerals of rocks instead of copper. Bronze, the alloy of tin and copper, is very difficult to bend. So the importance of dislocations in the individual crystals of copper and the mineral is very evident. Just as in the copper, so in rocks, in the minerals of rocks, it's dislocations through the minerals which can allow the rocks to bend and flow and behave in a plastic fashion under the application of great pressure and also heat. So that's another effect of metamorphism, then, that we can understand. The folding of rocks, their behavior as plastic substances rather than as the brittle solids that we know them on the surface. The end product of our series, you'll remember, was a rock that looked rather like granite. This one here, the sixth in the series. And you remember I mentioned it was an important point to which we'd come back. That, in fact, is not the final stage. We can go even farther than this. And this rock here is even more like an igneous rock, even more like granite. The crystals are larger. It's lost a lot of the layering in that small specimen. Still maintains a little bit, but is beginning to look very like granite. And that solved a problem for geologists, which was a puzzle for many years. In the roots of mountain ranges, in the eroded roots of mountain ranges, such as in the Cordillera of the United States and Canada on the West Coast, there are very large bodies of granite, elongated bodies, several hundred kilometers long and several tens of kilometers wide. And these bodies of granite are a volume, or have a volume, that's very difficult to explain if we try to understand that granite as the product of fractional crystallization of a basalt melt. You'll remember that basalt melts are the kind that are generated most commonly in the asthenosphere, and also basalt-like melts in subduction zones. Not quite the same as basalt, but nevertheless of that ilk. And it's rather difficult to produce enormous amounts of granite by um, crystallization from melts. It is, however, we can now understand, having looked at the end product of the metamorphism of a shale, quite possible to produce something that's rather granite-like by metamorphism. And the metamorphic, or the granites, in the, the eroded roots of the mountain belts are now very often explained as the final product of metamorphism of sedimentary rocks, such as 